Hello everyone, it's Rosie. Today we're going to talk about an issue that my patrons over on Patreon voted for. We're going to talk about a man. Specifically, we're going to talk about a white man who is well known for his work on a famous science fiction franchise. His early work was made with heavy producer and editorial oversight, as well as strict budget concerns. And his early work within the franchise is generally well liked by fans and critics alike. From this success, he was given more freedom, more creative control, larger budgets, until he was basically allowed to do whatever he liked with the franchise. And this, by most accounts, was a mistake. This new content with far, far less producer and editorial polishing is a mess. Less well structured, less compelling, bigger budgets available didn't really make up for the writing that many fans and critics felt was lacking compared to the earlier work. Eventually, he was removed from the franchise, and the franchise continues on, with fans looking forward to where the series will go without him. I am, of course, talking about Stephen Moffat. I mean, yeah, I'm also talking about George Lucas, and I'm talking about Brandon Braga, too. So let's go through that again. I'm not going to go into a whole bunch of detail here to avoid this video being forever long but let's do some painting with broad strokes. I'm calling this the Lucas problem, so let's start with George Lucas. The first Star Wars films were on a tight budget, with lots of editorial intervention. The first movie went through four drafts before filming began. Gloria Katz and Willard Hewick basically rewrote all of the dialogue in the entire first movie, and Lucas got help writing the screenplays for Empire and Return of the Jedi. Many people will also tell you that Marsha Lucas basically saved those early films in the edit. The first movie was made with no guarantee or actual plan for any sequels, so it had to be able to stand alone. And people love the first Star Wars trilogy. People love them, and they were the product of George Lucas being forced to work closely with and compromise with a team of other writers and editors. Then the prequels happened. George Lucas had more money than God, and no one could tell him no anymore. Marsha Lucas was, well, she left him for a variety of reasons, and absolutely wasn't helping with the movies anymore. And for the first time since A New Hope, George Lucas was actually directing the films himself again. He had complete creative control and all the money in the world to pour into CGI tomfoolery. And... Well, if you like the prequels, you're absolutely allowed to, but let's be real, it's not just the pod racing and bad dialogue, there are fundamental weaknesses in those movies. Characters with no story arcs, weird gaps of motivation, just utter silliness. And a lot of fans were really happy when we found out we were getting new Star Wars without Lucas. And of course, this is my opinion, but, well, that's my opinion right there. Now, let's look at Stephen Moffat. I have a whole two-part video on my feelings about Stephen Moffat already, so I'll keep this brief. When Stephen Moffat began working on Doctor Who, he was writing standalone episodes within Russell T. Davies' run. The series had a much smaller budget back then, and Moffat was held to pretty strict time constraints and editor oversight. And the episodes he produced in this time are often fan favorites. The Doctor Dances, Blink, The Girl in the Fireplace, these episodes, while they have their issues, are generally considered very good and fun. They deal with weirder ideas that are often creatively mind-bending, but they wrap up by the end of the episode and they feel cohesive and complete. Then, Stephen Moffat becomes showrunner. The show has a bigger budget and suddenly he has the freedom to try and tell season-long plots, stretching out his ideas for multiple episodes. And, well, look, if you ask me, which you're watching my video, so I guess you are, things went downhill pretty fast. There's no resolution to anything. Everything is super cryptic and mysterious, and there's never any proper or satisfying resolution. It's all wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey, and just not as good? The silence, river song, Trenzalore, just all of it, every mystery is resolved with another bigger mystery, and it kind of feels like we never actually solve anything. 
I know a lot of fans left during this time. I left during this time. And if you liked Moffat's run, that's okay. You're allowed. But, you know, I think a lot of us are happy the franchise is moving on without him now. I can watch Doctor Who again. Yay! Now, Branham Braga is the least well-known of these three, but look at the pattern. If you don't know, Branham Braga's early work was on Star Trek The Next Generation. TNG didn't always have the best budget, and most of the episodes needed to be self-contained. Sound familiar yet? Braga's best work happened on TNG. Timescape, Phantasms, Frame of Mind. These episodes are really good. They break the rules of reality, blur the lines between dreams and delusions, and generally just sort of mess with the audience's perceptions of things. At this time, Braga was also working really closely with Ronald Moore, who is sometimes credited with keeping character work high quality while Braga played with the bigger concepts. He also had a lot of oversight, especially from Michael Piller. And then... Well, I bet you can guess the pattern here. Braga becomes showrunner for Star Trek Voyager and then Star Trek Enterprise. And look, again, if you like Voyager and Enterprise, you're allowed. No one is stopping you from fanboying over Neelix or writing fanfiction about Archer. But I think we can all agree that the fandom at large did not receive those series as fondly overall, at least compared to TNG or DS9. A lot of the character work went kinda downhill. The plots lost focus. I mean, look at Threshold. Just look. They evolved into salamanders, and I just... I can't with that. So what's going on here? Why do these three writers have such a specific pattern? I mean, it's not just them, of course, but I think this comes down to two things. One, ego, and two, keep your editors. One, ego is pretty self-explanatory. A young and untested writer who has to prove themselves is hopefully going to be more open to suggestions to improve their work, more conscious of having their work be the best quality it can be to win over potential fans. But a writer that has had a few big hits may lose that, may begin to believe that anything they write is fabulous right away without more polishing, may think that fans will love whatever they create, no matter what. And that's a recipe for slipping quality. And I think that may have happened a few times here. And two, I think that this is just solid life advice for anyone who wants to write. Keep your editors. Everyone needs editors. George Lucas really, really needs a good editor. Anne Rice needs an editor. J.K. Rowling needs an editor. Mark Twain and Ernest Hemingway needed editors. Editors are not a sign of a weak writer. They are an essential part of the process. If your work is intended to be shared with an audience, having a second pair of eyes on it for input is a good thing. And I think, in a big way, that Lucas, Moffat, and Braga forgot this when they took control of their franchises, like, completely. As showrunners, or in Lucas's case, as, I guess, Star Wars god. They all have excellent ideas, but they desperately needed editors to help mold those ideas into, like, actual stories that make consistent and coherent sense. And it feels very clear that, as showrunners, they didn't have the oversight they had before, and less oversight means less editing and, well, nonsense. So yeah, I'd like to take a moment to thank my husband for helping me with some of the research in this video. He's the Trekkie in the house. Uh, and also, of course, a big thanks to my patrons, especially Vextiver, Garrett Robinson, Heva Assad, Sebastian Warren, and Adrian Alvarez. Y'all are the best. Be sure to head over to the Patreon page soon to vote on the next video topic. And if you liked listening to this queer millennial feminist ramble for a while and want to do it again, do all the YouTube things. See you next time.